Now we prepare to hear God's word preached, and in doing so, I invite you to open your Bibles, please, to Leviticus chapter 4 first. It is my custom, I think you remember, some of you remember from last time at least, that it is my custom to uh, read, uh, connect the dots, if you will, from the Old Covenant to the New, the Old Testament to the New, so though even though our sermon text is from the New Testament, Ephesians 1, I would like us to see, first of all, the underpinnings of what we see in Ephesians back in Leviticus. Now, Leviticus has uh, fallen on some hard times in the 21st century, and it's not one of those books that we turn to often, I suppose, in our daily Bible readings, unless we're reading through the entire Bible in the course of a year. And it's somewhat disdained by evangelicals, I suppose, in the 21st century. But it's rich, brothers and sisters, in foreshadows of redemption. That's what I want you to see here. I want you to see redemption through the blood of sacrifice. First Leviticus 4.27. Give you a moment to make sure you're there. God's Word says, If any one of the common people sins unintentionally by doing something against any of the commandments of the Lord, in anything which ought not to be done and is guilty, or if his sin which he committed comes to his knowledge, then he shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin which he has committed. Verse 30 now. Then the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger, Put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. Now verse 34. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. Verse, end of verse 35. So the priest shall make atonement for his sin that he has committed and it shall be forgiven him. Now flip over, if you will, to verse chapter 17, just a a couple of verses there, one verse in particular, Leviticus chapter 17. I call your attention to verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for... It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 where we find our sermon text. With all that in mind, all that groundwork laid in the Old Covenant, let us now hear from the New Covenant Scriptures. Ephesians 1, we'll begin at verse 3, but our sermon text is verses 7 and 8. Ephesians 1, 3 for context. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted, In the Beloved, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one All things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in Him. That's God's Word for God's people. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word redemption, the very word, has become trivialized in our 21st century. It has become a popular word even in novels, in books, on the movie screen, on television shows where Characters are said to be seeking redemption or characters are said to be finding redemption without any reference at all to our Lord Jesus Christ. 
On the other hand, we are reminded in this passage, verses 7 and 8 of Ephesians 1, once again, of this fact that this is one of the, if not the, central truth of Christianity, namely redemption. In fact, the titles of Christ, amongst the very many titles of Christ, the title of Redeemer is so near and dear to our hearts. And so the creed reminds us, the Apostles' Creed, that is, reminds us that we as a holy Catholic church, universal throughout time and around the world, confess that we believe in the forgiveness of sins. And then our favorite, many of our favorite hymns also remind us of this, how, how special this idea of redemption, how central it is to the Christian faith. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. All glory, laud, and honor to Thee, Redeemer, King. The church, our blessed Redeemer, saved with His own precious blood. And so the Holy Spirit uh, wants us to savor in this passage every aspect of our redemption. And as you know, Ephesians 1 is so full I chose only to unpack two verses this morning. But as we get our bearings, and I know you are very familiar with this this book and this chapter, but as we once again get our bearings here, let's consider the context. In verses 3 through 14, something you can't, you may be able to see in your translation, your version you hold in your hand. Verses 3 through 14, 11 verses is one long sentence in the original Greek language. And in that, we have praise for our salvation. One glorious truth after another is heaped upon each other. And we also see the work of the Trinity in these verses. In verses 3 through 6, we see the work of the Father who planned redemption. In verses 7 through 10, the section we're in this morning, we see redemption accomplished. And in verses 11 through 14, we see redemption applied. By the Holy Spirit. Many of you are familiar with John Murray's book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. That's what we see in this passage here. And verse 6 now, just before our sermon text, sets the stage. To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He has made us accepted in the Beloved. And so here for our theme this morning, we have redemption in the Beloved One. Just two things we're going to note here in these verses that are so pregnant and full. One, the very simple outline, easy to remember, I hope. One, the meaning of redemption. And secondly, the method of redemption. To make it simple, two M's. Something I don't often uh, do or are able to accomplish. But this morning, the meaning of redemption, the method of redemption. First then, in terms of our redemption in the Beloved One, the meaning of redemption. And of course, we could scan the Scriptures to see the meaning of redemption. We even saw a taste of it in the Old Covenant. The first thing that we're reminded of here that under, underlies all of this and that the Apostle fleshes out l- later in chapter 2 is that we, all of us, are born, come into this world with an inescapable sin problem that we need the forgiveness of sins, every single one of us. And the particular word used for sin here in the original Greek means a false step. Some have said to miss the mark, a trespass, or as one lexicon says, a lapse, or a deviation from truth and uprightness, either an unintentional error or willful transgression. And our confessions flesh this out. And remind us that we are guilty before God. We come into this world not only with our original sin, so that there is no such thing as an innocent little baby. And second, but on top of that, there are our sins of omission and our sins of commission that we can commit day by day. But then the apostle immediately brings us the good news of the gospel. That in him we have Redemption. The bad news is that we have an inescapable sin problem in and of ourselves inescapable, 
But the good news is, is that in Him we have redemption. And of course, the Lord's Supper signifies that to us again today. This word redemption here, there are three words in the original Greek language that speak of redemption. One speaks of uh, to buy. Another speaks, adds a little prefix to it. The word ex out of means to buy out of the market, never the, the slave market, never to return there. But this is that third word that is used throughout the New Testament, which means to loose from something, to set something free, or as Strong's puts it, liberation procured by the payment of a ransom. That's the word here translated redemption. Liberation procured by the payment of a ransom. And that's the meaning of the word redemption throughout the New Testament. Christ's work has set us free from the curse. Galatians 3 reminds us that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. How so? Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So our minds immediately, whenever we think of redemption, go to the cross Go to the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, where He performed a substitutionary atonement by means of His death and the shedding of His precious blood. He set us free, not only from the curse of sin, but to put it another way, from the guilt of sin. He set us free from the dominating and controlling power of sin. He set us free from sin's punishment from sin's penalty. The cross, the crucifixion, the substitutionary atonement of our Savior, His death, His shed blood, remind us that He and the Lord's Supper again reminds us that He satisfied the justice and the wrath of God. He paid the penalty so that our guilt could be removed. As Hebrews 9 puts it, for this reason He is the meteor of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. And so our minds go back to Leviticus. We think of that first covenant and how it foreshadowed all of this. We come to the table of the Lord again today. The Lord's Supper is there before you and you see the bread. And you remember that His body, you'll be reminded once again of that which you know so well, that His body was broken for you, beloved. So that you could have, be reconciled to the Father. That fellowship with that estranged God can be restored. All this is in the idea of redemption throughout the New Testament. The idea of, as the text puts it in verse 6, acceptance in the Beloved. Son of God. Loved by God and adopted into His family. Calvin says, He loves His people for the sake of the beloved. beloved." Well, it is in Him. Notice the language of the text. There's there's what redemption means. Notice the Again, this this pregnant phraseology here. Every word being full and powerful. It's in Him that we have redemption. Only God the Son, as you know, could liberate sinners like us by paying the required ransom. And so when we think we view the cross through the eyes of faith in the Lord's Supper and from Lord's Day to Lord's Day, we, we are reminded that indeed redemption was accomplished once for all. That as the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians, Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Or as we sing sometimes, He paid the debt and made me free. We are set free. He has loosed our chains our spiritual chains. He has redeemed us from sin and from all the power of the devil, as the Heidelberg Catechism says. Or as Colossians 1 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption.
Christ bought us. He set us free from spiritual bondage. Never again to return to that bondage. And as Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. John 8. So, with the hymn writer, we often sing, My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. The Lord's Supper reminds us of all of these truths. That Christ Jesus is the only, the one and only Redeemer of God's elect. That He is your Redeemer, brother and sister, by grace through faith in Him alone. He bought you. And what was the price? You have it set before you in these physical elements. His humiliation, which we just celebrated. His incarnation. His sinless life. His suffering under Pontius Pilate. His descent into the hell of God's wrath against the sin of the, His elect. He was crucified. He really died. He was really buried. He rose from the dead and ascended. And the Lord's Supper is also a time for us to reconsider and rededicate our hearts and minds and lives to Christ. And so the reminder comes in Galatians 5, since all of this is true, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So we've seen the remaining of your redemption that first of all, we have an inescapable sin problem, one that we cannot escape from ourselves. And secondly, that in Him, however, the good news is we have redemption. But there's more good news. We haven't left this first verse yet because there's still more. There's another grand word that jumps off the page. Forgiveness. In Him we have not just redemption, but that redemption entails the forgiveness of sins. And that word forgiveness there means to dismiss or to release. It, it's in the New Testament 17 times. And nine of those, those times in the Old King James, it's translated remission. And the rest of the times, forgiveness. Let me just give you a couple examples from Matthew 26. Jesus said, For this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sin, same Greek word as you forgiveness here. Or in Acts 2.38, Peter says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There it is again, remission or forgiveness. Synonyms of the same Greek word. Or Acts 26, To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of of sin. Without redemption, there is no forgiveness of sins. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 3, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness is a reality for you and me, brothers and sisters, because your sins and mine are not charged to our account. They're not imputed to us any longer because by sovereign grace, a substitute has stepped forward, our Lord Jesus Christ, and His righteousness now is counted as yours, imputed to you. And so the Lord's Supper once again reminds us, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the first thing. That redemption in the Beloved One is fleshed out in the meaning of redemption so wonderfully set forth before us by the Holy Spirit in verse 7a. And then the second thing. Now, we've seen the meaning of redemption. Of course, we've not exhausted it. We could spend several sermons just talking about that thing, the meaning of redemption, couldn't we? But now we move on to the method of your redemption. It's important to know the meaning of redemption. It's important to know what we believe and why we believe it. But now, how the method that you know so well. No doubt this is going through fundamentals that you have learned for a long time.
but it is one of the hallmarks of Christianity, and in particular the Reformed faith, that we are not afraid or ashamed to be reminded of these things over and over again. The method of your redemption, in a nutshell, through Christ's bloodshed and death. Verse 7 says, we have redemption. How so? Through His blood. That is to say that atonement for our sin problem, atonement for your sins and mine, could be accomplished in no other way than through His blood. That what we read of in Leviticus 17 was unalterable. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And then as Hebrews, the author of Hebrews fleshes that out in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, he says, according to the law, which we read earlier, Almost all things are purified with blood. And you know that famous next phrase. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no other way for sins to be atoned for. Or as the Apostle of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. That once the penalty has been paid, once the atonement has been made, it is once and for all time, never to be repeated. This is good news for sinners like you and me, isn't it? Have you deviated from God's path in 2015? Here's the remedy. The blood of the God-man atones for our trespasses. And it is the only provision that ever has been made or ever will be made for the forgiveness of our sins. And the Lord's Supper reminds us of that. It also reminds us that as far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. We've seen the method as we consider the method of your redemption. We are reminded again that it is through Christ's bloodshed and death. Of course, the wine and the bread symbolize that to us. But what blood, someone might ask, the blood of bulls and goats, the blood of an animal, the bloody sacrifices and death of the old covenant? The scriptures make it clear here that they only typified and foreshadowed the sacrifice of God the Son. Psalm 40, quoted in the New Testament as a reference to Christ, reads in part, verse 6, Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your laws within my heart. No wonder the Father says of Jesus, This is my beloved Son, in whom... I am well pleased at both His baptism and His transfiguration. No, not just any blood as we sometimes sing. No other blood will do. Not just any death would do. It must be His blood. It must be His death. As Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Jesus willingly The Christ willingly became the pre-incarnate, pre-existent Christ. The eternal second person of the Trinity willingly became God incarnate. God in flesh appearing so that He could shed that precious blood from those five bleeding wounds. So that He could suffer real death. 
as, a, as an atonement, as a sacrifice, as a substitute. The Beloved, the Son, knowing like no one else what pleases the Father, in perfect harmony with His will, did not wait for the Father to order Him to act, but willingly, as Philippians 2 says, offered Himself, volunteered to do the Father's will. And in this, He was not passive. He was not a victim. He was not a hapless victim who was a victim of circumstances, a victim of the crowd, of the mob, a victim of the Roman Empire or the lawless Jews. He willingly offered Himself to make atonement. He was not passive even in His death. He laid down His life. Not because I said that's the truth. But He Himself said in John 10, My Father loves Me because I lay down My life that I may take it again. No one takes it from Me. Pilate could not take it from Him. Herod could not take it from Him. Caesar Himself could not take it from Him. Nor could the unbelieving Jews, the Old Covenant people and church members, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Christ did many other things besides make atonement on the cross, as you know. He did many other things as He walked on the earth as a man. and You know them from the Gospels. But His primary purpose, as He said Himself, was to seek and to save that which was lost. To give His life a ransom for many. You and I included, brothers and sisters. That was already prophesied in Isaiah 53, wasn't it? He poured out His soul unto death and He was numbered with the transgressors and He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's what redemption is all about. The Son of Man, Jesus said in Matthew 20, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. And we celebrate that again today at the table of the Lord. All the spiritual blessings that are here laid out for us so beautifully by the Holy Spirit in chapter 1 come to us by one means only, and that is through the shed blood and the death, the atoning death of the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. And so I invite you and challenge you, brothers and sisters, to sing for joy the new song with the four living creatures and the 24 elders in heaven as we hear it in Revelation 5. For you were slain, they sing, and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation have made, of king, made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. That precious shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ symbolized here this morning in the, in the wine will never lose, it, lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. We, as we consider this Redemption in the Beloved One and the method of our redemption. We've learned that in Him alone we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. But long before Jesus ever hung on the cross and made atonement on the cross, according to the riches of His grace, God set His rich grace in motion. Because we read, if you'll back up to verse 4, as we read it in our Scripture reading this morning and remind you again, long before that dreadful day and that wonderful day at the same time, we read in verse 4 that He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. 
You remember that definition of grace. Getting from God what you do not deserve. How much grace do you get according to the text? The riches of His grace which He made to abound toward us. Listen to the superlatives. This Greek word for grace here means abundant, great, extreme, plentitude. Why did God redeem us? Because He is rich in grace. God is no Scrooge. God is no miser when it comes to giving out the abundance of His riches of grace. True, the Father could have cast every single one of us into hell with no hope of redemption and never have batted an eye, so to speak, and been perfectly just and holy in doing so. But where sin abounded, Paul writes in Romans 5, grace abounded much more. God's rich grace delivered up His Son for us all. So in 2016, may our gratitude for His rich grace abound more and more month by month. The riches of that grace are fleshed out in other passages in a parallel passage in Ephesians or just down the, just down the page actually in Ephesians 1.18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of His glory? of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Whose grace is poured out upon you? His grace. The subject matter is still the Son. As I said previously, the Father was in the spotlight, you might say. Coming up, the Son, the Spirit will be in the spotlight in the following verses. But here it's the Son. It's the Son who is rich in mercy. But in chapter 2, verse 4 says, God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. In chapter 3, verse 8, the Apostle says, speaks of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Who gets this grace? It could be translated this way, verse 8, which He provided in abundance to precious words for us. Chapter 2, verse 7, that says that reminds us of the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Or chapter 3 of the same, this same book says, reminds us that according to the, he, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with His might according to the riches of His glory. You and I who have been adopted, who have been highly favored, who have been, to use the language of the passage, accepted in the Beloved. And how do you get this grace? It's all of God. The passage infers that. His grace, verse 8, which He made to abound toward us. In this, we are passive and He is active. Or as one translation says, which He lavished upon us. Is this the best kind of provision for you? Could there be something better than this? No, because it is the omniscient Son of God who provided this rich grace. This abundant grace is His all-wise provision based on His unique insights. We read in the text that He provided in abundance for us in all wisdom and prudence. In all wisdom, Sophia, the, the capacity to understand and thereby to act wisely. His provision for you in this, this way is based on His unlimited understanding of your need. Christ provided this grace for you, this rich grace for you and for me, beloved brothers and sisters, out of His impeccable insight. The word translated prudence in some of your Bibles there is only one other place in the whole New Testament. 
in Luke chapter 1. It means thinking based on insight and wisdom. One translation I think reads better, in all wisdom and insight. It's reminding us that this grace that is given to us, this rich grace, is a result of the prudence and insight of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in bringing out and bringing about our redemption. That is his insight into our need. His insight that allowed on the, that provided for justice to be served on the one hand, for his insight to make sure that God's honor and law were upheld, but at the same time his insight in how to not only accomplish that, but at the same time to show grace and mercy to rescue condemned sinners like you and I. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrates great wisdom and great with insight on the part of the Son. Any other gospel is anathema, cursed by God. This gospel is too simple for some. It's not complicated enough. It's not complex enough for some. For others, it's foolish to think that this simple thing could be the way in which God would redeem sinners. But it is full of wisdom and insight, this gospel. His rich grace abounded to us, brothers and sisters. Grace to see the wisdom and the insight of Christ's gospel called foolishness by so many in our culture. And the devil constantly seeks to undermine this gospel in various ways. But the Holy Spirit gives us unshakable confidence in the gospel so that we come to the Lord's Supper with full confidence in it. And so we've seen, once again, not for the first time probably, we've seen the meaning of redemption fleshed out here, that we, by grace, brothers and sisters, have been purchased and set free from our shackles. And we've seen the method of your redemption through the blood of the only begotten Son of God, according to His rich grace, according to His wisdom that was evident in the plan of salvation and still is, according to the prudence and insight of our great prophet, priest, and king in accomplishing our redemption. And so now, let us celebrate our redemption in the Beloved One at the table of the Lord.